Greetings and welcome to the East Coast Anti Federalist Show. My name is Brutus. I'm joined today by Kona Bianca. We can be reached online at www.ecaf.us. That's E C A F or face spelled backwards. We can be reached with questions or comments at info at ecaf.us. And we now want to move on to a series of articles that affect the faith agenda. There was an article about an organization called People Can Change, which tries to help people who are suffering from unwanted sexual attractions. And I always get sort of annoyed with the attacks on these organizations. The attack is that they are engaging in deceptive trade practices because people go and pay money and then they don't change. Well, welcome to Alcoholics Anonymous and Stop Smoking USA and uh, weight loss programs. All I mean, think of all of the programs that people go to to pay money and most of them don't succeed, but they still want to try because they want to make their lives different. There's nothing wrong with that. And as long as there isn't something that's really fraudulent about it, I think that a low success rate is not a deceptive trade practice. If it is, we have to shut down you know, anti-smoking groups and weight loss groups and Alcoholics Anonymous groups. And well, when you think about it, you know, like alcoholism, you don't, you're not born an alcoholic, you become one over time. And some people seem to be more vulnerable to it than others are. But my understanding is, and fortunately I'm not an alcoholic, once you get to that point, there are ways to get out of it, but they are hard and they require faith and real internal strength. And once you do get out of it, you are never not an alcoholic. You just become an alcoholic who chooses not to drink. So if that's okay for people who are alcoholics, why isn't that okay for somebody who descended into the pit of really reckless, self-destructive sexual behavior. Why shouldn't they be able to ask for help in order to change their lives? Well, you know good and well that it's, it's a double standard all the time. So. I know, and I'm calling them on it. <laughs> so you, you can't change when it comes to homosexuality, but you can change when it comes to doing pretty much anything else. And it, and anything that they acknowledge is bad for you. you. You can change that. It isn't just that you can't change. It's that you, you can, are not allowed to even want to change, to even think you can change, and nobody else is allowed to try to help you. So here's their irony. You can't stop being gay yes. if you're gay. You can't... Go from gay to straight. But you can go from straight to gay. That's the contradiction number two. Contradiction number three, but if you were born a male and you want to become a female, ah, you can change all you want. <laughs> or what was your first contradiction? Well, it's, it's, it's not the contradiction, but it's, it's that, it's, well, it's a lie. <laughs> that, that if you're gay, you can't want to stop being gay. Right. Okay. Or that you shouldn't want to stop being gay. That right. you are somehow denying something that's good about yourself. Right. And so it's, it's, a, it's a very, the second one is a variation on that, that if you have unwanted same-sex attractions, you can't seek help to overcome those unwanted same-sex attractions. For example, you could still have those attractions. You could still be inclined to, I don't know, look at gay porn or whatever, but not act on They're like, no, 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 embrace your feelings. You know, this is good, this is good. But, it, but, the, but the third one shows the utter ridiculousness of that. Because, and this is something that I tried to argue, I don't think the National Organization for Marriage really wanted to hear it, but I tried to argue it as we were fighting the marriage fight. This transgenderism is next, which we can see it is, and it is the furthest form. Because people are gay at different levels. People are homosexual at different levels. There are, there are plenty of people who you see in their daily lives, they act, they, what do you call it, they, they gender norm. They're cisgender. They look cisgendered, yes. you know. They dress... Heteronormative. Heteronormative. There we go. They look, act, dress in normal colors. They don't want to be flamboyant or flashy. They don't talk with a lisp. Men don't call each other girlfriend. But they're homosexual. And then you have slight variations towards the next norm. You, you have people who maybe put on a little bit of lipstick, put too much mousse in their hair, you know, you get to the metrosexual definition, and then you have people who go even further than that, they might wear scarves and become interior decorators and such, and then you have the people who go all the way out and they hang out at gay clubs and they don't mind being seen in public, these are your outed homosexuals, and then you have the transgender. Transgender is just the next stage in that progression. 
of course you have some, and I think they're probably a, probably be a minority, but you have some transgenders, and I mean people who've gone all the way. I don't mean like a guy who's not sure. He's about just where wearing he is. a dress. Right? <laughs> but people who've gone all the way and and had the full Bruce Jenner done on them, and yet they don't actually like men. You know, I hear that's the case. Doesn't make any sense to me, but I'll accept that there's probably a couple of people out there in that category. I think they're all violating nature's call to them because, and, and this statistic really just dumbfounded me when I just chanced upon it. Just about every human being put on this earth, if they do not act on it, they are at least born or, or will develop at puberty a desire to have sex. And they will probably act on that desire at some point and have sex. And the vast majority of those will have children. And that kind of goes together. Like, that's why you have this yeah, desire I would say so. to have sex. I mean, I think even but, a pagan could figure that one out. Right, but, but we think of it like it's completely disjointed and not right. related. Right. You know? I mean, think about every other species on the planet. And we've got to talk about that conservatism book somewhere. It just really annoys me. But, mm -hmm. but think about every other species on the planet. Trees, flowers, bacteria... It's like that's all they live for, <laughs> you know, is to eat, consume, breathe, and reproduce. Why would we be any different? And yet, we do things that are completely contradictory to that when we go down the homosexual road or when we chop off our genitalia so that, hope you don't change your mind a couple years from now because you've taken away your ability to actually reproduce. It's very, very counterintuitive. But... Sidebar, I did want to say about one of the things that liberals probably go both sides on this issue. They'll tell you, for example, if you're fat, you should love yourself. You should embrace yourself. You should accept who you are, right? But another liberal in the same environment, in the same room, will say, you need to lose some weight, you know? And so to the, to the extent of there being a whole bunch of different homosexuals, most homosexuals are so self-conscious about themselves, I mean homosexual men, that it's not common that you find overweight homosexual men, at least those who act the part. But then you've got the, the big burly guys, they, they call them bears, I guess, who, you know, you want to cuddle up next to or whatever, and it's like, okay, well, I guess there are big burly homosexual men. So, so it takes all types. And in the same way... The liberal will tell a big fat person, you know, why are you hanging on to all this weight? And they'll they'll harp on you every time they see you. Well, why don't you eat less? Well, why don't you exercise more? Why don't you do this, that, or the other? And so, whether consciously or subconsciously, I've always been concerned about my weight, especially since I'm a lot heavier now than I used to be when I was 18. And and I thought I was fat when I was 18, but I definitely think I'm fat now. So I've been fasting and miraculously a lot of weight has peeled off my body but sidebar there is this guy named Mohammed al kek who is a palestinian prisoner in israel uh, i think we would call him a terrorist or at least a terrorist sympathizer i think it's actually a, a reporter and he was detained by israeli authorities and he and a lot of other people but to protest his detainment he went on a hunger strike Mm. <laughs> back in November, November 25th, I guess. And when I first heard about this, he was on his 89th day. Whoa. <laughs> and it looks like he's finally ended it as of February 26th at 94 days. Wow. And that surpassed some IRA hunger strikers, Irish Revolutionary Army, who back in 1981 fasted for 73 days. And died. Okay. Now, the interesting thing, he, and I don't know enough about all the details, but he doesn't get full credit for all 94 days because he passed out and they fed him intravenously or whatever while he was passed out. So, you know, he's, he's small cookies. But I found out in researching this that just by fasting 40 and 51 days like I did last year, 
I surpassed Gandhi way, way, way long time. The Gandhi's longest fast was 21 days. Oh, really? Yes. Oh. You know, and so that's, that, that tells you about the left. They can sensationalize anything. Most of his fast, the one where he stopped the Muslims and the Hindus from fighting each other and they were... They For five up, minutes. Right. Well, it was, it was six days. Oh. It was a six-day fast. Yeah. I'm like, I can do six days standing on my head, yeah. right? So this notion, therefore, that you can't change that you can't do these things is absurd you can do whatever you put your mind to and it's harder if it's a lifelong change or if it's a lifestyle change but yes it can be done yeah i mean it's it's obviously possible there are living breathing examples of it all over the place if you just care to look for them but my big thing is the insistence that government shut it down that nobody have the opportunity to believe different things or try different things or try to make their lives better if they think that's what they need to do. The other thing that always grates on me, and you'll see this all the time in articles, is they will refer to the two APAs, the American Psychological Association and the American Psychiatric Association. And the word that this author used was debunked. They said both of those professional organizations had debunked the theory that people who choose to do something about an unwanted sexual attraction have the ability to actually do it. That is not true. It is true that the two organizations changed their position, but I want to be very clear about this. They did so after extensive political pressure was brought to bear on them. They did not change their position because of a scientific discovery. Nobody has scientifically debunked anything. And people who refer to that, they are referring to a political maneuver, not to science. And I would also point out that the APAs and the AMA, American Medical Association, they're all controlled by homosexuals. It's not even close. Like maybe there's one. Practicing ones or or just sympathizers? Well, I say controlled. You mean by the lobby? Right. Yeah. So It's powerful. Um, calling people names, calling people bigot and hater is really powerful stuff. A lot but, of people don't want to... But, but I mean, more so than that, I mean, use the word sympathizer, if you will. Everyone who sits on those boards, maybe with, you know, you, there might be a one person out and he doesn't want to raise his hand and be the only right. person in the room right. saying, I disagree. But so 99% of the AMA, the APA, the other APA are all of this consensus agreement that there's nothing wrong with homosexuality. And it's tragic because they just they just on a dime changed their mind homosexuality was a disorder a mental disorder at one point and then bam they took a vote and suddenly it's not a mental disorder right so is is alcohol they they decided that alcoholism is a disease right and i say how can alcoholism be a disease but homosexuality is perfectly okay You, you talk about not being an alcoholic I say, well, if it's a disease, are people born alcoholics? Are people born addicted to nicotine? I mean, you wouldn't know until you got your first taste of it. They but picked it you... up at the public swimming pool. <laughs> a communicable disease well, that I, has infected them. I had a relative who was a doctor. He's passed on now. But when Marion Barry had his problems, it was stated by my doctor relative, he's sick. We need to, we need to care for him and, and, and hope for his improvement because he's sick. Not that he's made choices in his life that leads him to be caught in a hotel room with a hooker smoking crack cocaine on TV. Right. No. Sounds he's like sick. he was seeking pleasure to me. <laughs> What's sick. the difference between being sick and seeking pleasure? Yeah. And that really just kind of embodies the left's mentality. You know, when it's, you, you have a saying, I can't remember, it's, it's okay for me, but not for thee, yes. something like that. And this is how they approach everything. So when they look at homosexuality, that's something they want. They're going to make every excuse in the world why it's okay. But you you have an objection to homosexuality or you want to do something for a religious reason that would interfere with their sinful pleasures, if you will. It's not necessarily sexual, but they love the sexual sins, but pick some other sin and they want to do it, like murdering your infant baby. And no, you can't do that. You can't even have an opinion that that's acceptable. And I just don't understand why intelligent people don't see through that charade. Welcome back. I don't think you mentioned the name of the article. I did not. It's uh, Gay Conversion Therapy Faces New Legal Challenge in Virginia. And where is it published? The Guardian.com. So it's a British outlet. 
and they're talking about... A lefty British. Yeah. Uh, And pressing their case to have... But this article is interestingly balanced. Except Um, for the word debunked. Yeah. (laughs) And pressing their case to have the people can changes, activities, in effect shut down, the complaints can point to a case last year in which a similar gay conversion group, Jonah, was ordered to cease operating by a New Jersey judge having been found by a jury to have broken the state's consumer fraud protection law. The trial established the concept that commercial entities that claim they can cure homosexuality are acting essentially as con artists. And Jonah is, of course, an acronym. It's Jews offering new alternatives for healing. And they have had to cease, because of that New Jersey court decision, they they pretty much ceased operating in the United States. They've gone back to Israel. And so there's this article I found on that. Gay conversion therapists find safe haven in Israel because even though they're very pro-gay over there as well, they're at least allowing this group to operate and give people who want to leave the same-sex lifestyle an opportunity to do so. And there are lots of other groups, uh, Exodus, uh, Exodus used to, Exodus, the leaders of Exodus defected to the other side. <laughs> and uh, but there are many other such groups, uh, groups that I dealt with in our marriage fight, where the various usually Orthodox Jews came down trying to combat this, this thing in their own community. And so there's a lot of Jews in New Jersey, in New York area, they've been, they've been pushed out. And they have to go operate in in Israel just to bring people back to what the Bible says Mm -hmm. about homosexuality. And I observed at the time, I said, this must be a real problem. Because a couple of years ago, back in 2003, when Lawrence versus Texas was being argued, I was reading up on it. And I figured, well, the Reformed Jews, they're going to go for this because they're basically non-believers anyway. They just mm-hmm. they go to services just so that they can pay their tithes and say, I'm, I'm a good Jew. But they don't really believe in anything that the scriptures say. But surely the conservative Jews are going to hold out, right? Uh-uh. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and their lead rabbi came out and said, this is such a problem in our community. And I was like, really? And so... and And... and so conservatism, conservative Judaism is gone, and really it's middle of the road. And I was reading the other day, I can't remember, there's a, there's a minor distinction is what, what makes someone conservative versus orthodox. But orthodox are the more to-the-scripture uh, group of Jews. So what we think of when we say conservative is really orthodox uh, in, in the Jewish community. And there's a lot of it that's not in the scripture, but they, they got the Talmud and all that kind of stuff too. Well... Now you're seeing that the Orthodox community is also challenged by this epidemic. I, I call it part of the, the triad, not even the triad of evil, the triad of death. Because it's the same thing affecting the black community. Mm-hmm. Uh, we've, got, we've got crime in our communities. We've got abortion killing our communities. And the left is pushing homosexuality onto our communities, which leads to AIDS and then death. And I think we've got a couple articles that touch on those Oh, subjects. yes. Um... You, you sent me a link, and I, don't, I didn't write down what publication it was in, but it was a short article about the risk for HIV infection by race and how shockingly high it is for black men. Who, black men who are having sex with other men, their risk for HIV is one in two. I mean, it's astronomical. And, of course... It, when they, they compare it to other groups, uh, Hispanics, it's 1 in 4, and whites, it's only 1 in 11. And just to give you an idea, uh, for men who are having sex with other men who are black, it's 1 in 2 is their risk for HIV infection. For all black men, regardless of what they're doing, it's 1 in 20. So how can you look at a statistic like that and say, oh, you know what, let's have a parade with politicians present and let's promote this behavior? This is what is so frustrating to me because people can see that alcohol is damaging to people if it's used in excess. They can see that tobacco is damaging to people if it's used in excess. And there are all these efforts on the part of the government to try to get people to change their behavior and lead different lives. And then this is just completely ignored. And the question that comes up is that, well, what is different? I mean, 
Is there something genetically that makes black men more vulnerable to an infection? I doubt that is the case. It's got to be uh, behavior related. Well, what is so different about gay black men and white gay men in their behavior? I mean, what is it that's putting them so much more at risk? If it's not something genetically related to race, which I doubt it is, it's got to be cultural. Mm -hmm. But the article, as usual, doesn't even ask the question. So the article is in USA Today. It's CDC colon one in two black gay men will be diagnosed with HIV. And you know, all that's true. And I, and I think the problem is, well, we can be glad they didn't say what the left would normally say, which is it's because of racism. It's institutional racism. They would probably conclude that black people are less likely to seek treatment or, or they're so poor that they don't, they're not able to get to a doctor to get preventative drugs or things like that, and that would explain the higher preponderance. But that's really not doesn't the case. explain it. Because so. they're talking about being diagnosed, not being treated. And I think that the prevention drugs are probably a joke anyway. So uh, to me, my my I will put on my Louis Farrakhan hat there. Okay. Please do, Louis. And, well I just want to say so, Louis. You know the white man no. <laughs> <laughs> there is a war on black America, especially on black men, to effeminize us, to and, and how much easier will the job be if you can get us to castrate ourselves? Right. And so they're putting up uh, it's this orange is the new black guy, um, Laverne Cox, okay, and RuPaul, all these other. Laverne uh, is a female, a male. And Laverne Cox is a male. Okay. There's actually an article called Laverne Cox is a man. Is is he a transsexual? I think he's just dressing up. Okay. I mean, if you see if you see his normal picture, he doesn't even look attractive. He's okay. like a dude with a beard and you know just uh. <laughs> but but put on enough makeup and a dress and whatever else. I don't know if he has real breasts or what, but it's just you could have been fooled. Mm -hmm. Just like RuPaul, you saw that in a club, you might have. As for its number, and yet that's just a straight up man, <laughs> okay? All right. And uh, this is a form of warfare, and there's somebody out there who wants us to fall for that because who is your stalwart, most strongest opposition to the gay agenda? It's the black preachers, it's the black leaders. So, so how great that they've already got Al Sharpton, Jesse Jackson. And even to an extent, Louis Farrakhan. Louis Farrakhan isn't out there promoting the gay agenda, but he's promoting Keith Ellison, who is promoting the gay agenda. So it's, it's, it's evil on many levels. Now there's another article. It says, and this is sort of a follow-on to an article that was big in the news last month, South Africa bishops, same-sex couples, are full members of the church. This is the Anglican church. And so the bishops of the South African Anglican Church, following in the footsteps of Archbishop Desmond Tutu, following in the footsteps of Nelson Mandela, following in the footsteps of all these black leaders who, you know, tell somebody this in America, and they're like, don't, don't profane, you know, my idol, if you will. I love Nelson Mandela. I love Tutu. We fought against apartheid. Yeah, and you're fighting for the homosexualization of black men. And so now they're saying that if you are a homosexual in the Anglican church, you are a full member of the church. We're not going to put you out. We're not going to say that you've got to change in any way. And it's just sad because it was the African church that played the biggest part in sanctioning the Episcopalian church mm -hmm. in America. And the Anglican Church in Canada is seeing that. And they're not saying, oh, we better start acting right. They're following the Episcopalian Church. They are, they are supporting what the Episcopalian Church has done. So now they're in South Africa. They're in South Africa. They're going to work their way up and get into places like Nigeria and, and wherever else the Anglican Church might be. I'm sure they're in Uganda, wherever they speak English. I'm sure, and, and wherever else they can spread otherwise, because it's not exclusive to English-speaking nations. And so if they can infiltrate in that way, I'm sure that they will. So that bothers me a lot. And then you had another story 
which talks about how they have these HIV pre prevention drugs, and I guess they had people taking them, people especially who are engaging in risky sexual behavior, taking these HIV prevention drugs on the notion that if you take this drug, you're not going to get HIV. Well, guess what? The yeah. first guy contracts HIV while on the, the HIV prevention drug. And this article is on TheVerge.com. And you had taken some notes on that? or Yes. One thing I noticed that was missing is it doesn't talk about the cost of this drug and it doesn't talk about who's paying for it, which is something that would seem to me to be very relevant. Mm -hmm. The other thing is... Um, He's described as a man who had sex with other men. So it's not like he had a boyfriend, mm -hmm. one boyfriend. I mean, this is the problem. People, these statistics and this behavior needs to be exposed for what it is. What's being held up on television programs and in legislatures giving testimony is not the reality of what is happening in the streets with this. And a prevention drug just, this drives me nuts. Whenever you make something safer for people, people will be more reckless. Why not? Hmm. You know, I'm protected. I've taken this pill. I can have all the fun I want. It just leads them into this self-destruction. Self-destruction. And taxpayers are paying for it. But unfortunately, that's... Liberalism. The reason they want an HIV prevention drug. You know, it would be nice to cure Magic Johnson and everybody else with AIDS and just be like, okay, you're cured now. Go and sin no more. Yeah. But that's not why they want to cure AIDS. They want to cure AIDS so that they, they can, can sin more. They can sin more, exactly. <laughs> and, you know, I was thinking about this, and it's not politically correct, if you will, in our day and age, but, you know, when you look back at biblical views on marriage and chastity and things like that, on a certain level, you had to have a commandment there saying, you know, be true to your wife and, and don't run around and have sex with whores and all this kind of stuff. But guess what? If there wasn't a commandment, it would still be a good idea because they didn't have penicillin back then. And they, you know, once, once you got messed up, you were done. Really? <laughs> okay. Especially with, with, with some of the things, and that's how you hear about people going blind and people dying, especially when they had the Black Plague. And, blue, and now we got the Zika virus, and they're saying, I haven't really studied up on it, but they're saying it's sexually transmitted. So, you know, who wants to get that by having sex? The natural element would encourage scrupulous sexual behavior, monogamy, and everything else that is imposed by commandment in the Bible. Well, now all these advances in medicine have made it so that, hey, the only reason you got to obey the Bible is because you, you want to have good standing in your church. <laughs> and we know well from reading the papers that not a lot of people have good standing in their churches. So mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's a mixed blessing. You know, it's great when someone can escape all of the years of pain and suffering that they would have endured yes. had there not been cures and vaccines and what have you. When you think about all the women who may be dying from this HP, you know, getting HPV, well, that's great. But a lot of people don't want to get the HPV vaccine because they're saying, I'm going to teach my kids abstinence. Okay, and then they won't get HPV because they're only going to have sex with their husband who hopefully won't have HPV before they get married. But the left is like, no, 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 no. We need to vaccinate all your kids because we're going to teach those kids to want to have sex. We'll be back after the break. Welcome back. And then we go back to what I said before. Every single solitary human being is programmed to have sex, is programmed to do what's necessary to make children. Man, you know, they've, they've got a large pool of willing contestants that they can try to push their agenda on. And the chances are they're going to be successful with a lot of them, which, which is affecting a lot of our politics. I don't know particularly how people feel about Ted Cruz, but I know that with Rick Santorum, people were alarmed when he said, I don't like porn, porn should be illegal. And and uh, occasionally, I think it's Albert Moeller or somebody, he, he'll go off on a screed about the damaging effects of pornography. 
And so this goes back to the whole sexting thing we were talking about. It's not just that kids are being kids. It's that there's this pornographic element to it that potentially leads to destructive behavior. But the left wants to encourage the destructive behavior. And so when you say, I'm going to make something like that illegal, whether it's sexting or just basic pornography or even some of the more intense forms of pornography, the, the average person, forget the radical left, the average person gets up in arms. Because I don't, don't touch my, my porn collection. Don't touch my sex toys mm -hmm. and whatever else. And I think that that is a powerful force that you have to fight with because modesty, modesty is becoming less and less of a virtue. And it is. To that point. So I'm, I'm at this progressive Chevrolet debate and I have to go to the bathroom. And I go to find the bathroom and there's only one door. And guess what symbol is on the door? What? Male and female. Oh, no. I go in, and there's urinals all along the floor. And I'm just like, oh, my God, well, it is progressive Chevrolet. So it wasn't one where you went in by yourself and locked the door behind you. No, no, no. It was, it was many stalls and So many I mean, it was urinals. meant for men and women to be in there using them at the same time. Yeah, it kind of had the feeling of an elementary school, but I think it was yeah. like a community center or whatever. Okay. But it was both a male and female. Bathroom. bathroom and so there's a recent case south dakota but it's happening all over the country where you know in south dakota they have a republican governor but the republican governor vetoed it vetoed a bill passed by the legislature saying boys and boys bathrooms girls and girls bathroom and it's very very frustrating that here you have the will of the people being overturned by one official who's obviously getting a lot of pressure from the homosexual left you also have, was it Georgia? Georgia passed a law, I think in the, in the vein of religious liberty, kind of like what they were pursuing in Indiana, mm -hmm. and to the same effect. All the companies are like, we're going to boycott, we're going to leave Georgia. So that one's, I think it's, did it fail? I haven't heard. Uh, Ryan T. Anderson in The Daily Signal. The hypocrisy of big business attacking Georgia's religious liberty bill. He says all these big companies are threatening boycotts. Hilton Worldwide, Marriott, and Intercontinental Hotels Group, the Metro Atlanta Chamber of Commerce, and the Georgia Hotel and Lodging Association have all spoken out against the Religious Freedom Bill as opening the door to widespread discrimination. Ryan T. Anderson, who's a good guy, uh, is basically saying that why don't, why don't they leave these Christians alone and let them... Right. Uh, because it's not, it's not requiring that they discriminate or what have you it's it's really just saying you have the freedom to I'm, I'm just going to use the word discriminate you have the freedom to say i'm not going to bake a cake for a homosexual wedding i'm not going to take pictures at your homosexual wedding and this is one of the things that got me about this whole series of cases as well we get ahead of ourselves by to, to put it in solomon terms we cut the baby in half before going to solomon and saying, can I have half my baby? <laughs> right. And when Solomon says no, we, we were like, why did I lose that case? We're saying, you know what? Baronel Sussman is a perfect example, but they're all like this. Uh, uh, you know, this guy, Rob, is my friend, and I've served him on past occasions. I give him flowers, I arrange flowers for him, and, and other situations, but I just don't want to do it for marriage. I just don't want to do it for a wedding ceremony. My Christian convictions are telling me that, that I can't do that. So could I please, please, please just have half of what I want? No, ask for the whole kid and caboodle. Say, you know what? I have a religious objection against homosexuality. I want to be able to serve whom I want and whom I don't want. I may have served Rob in the past. And like I said, there's, there's a couple other cases all around the country. I think there's one in North Carolina recently. And I've served these people in the past. But when I served them, I didn't know what they were engaged in. Now that I know, I reserve the right to withhold service. If the baby then gets cut in half, you're still at the point of only having to serve them for non-wedding related situations. But if you start at the halfway point, you're not going to get half of anything. You're, at best, you can get a quarter, and you're probably not going to get anything at all. This, this, I think, is the mistake we've been making from the beginning. The Republican right has been saying, I don't like same-sex marriage, but we'll give them civil unions. Mm -hmm. And they uh, so that, so that's actually the case. Uh, civil unions in Italy. Italy, 
did they just legalize civil unions? Or are they about to? <laughs> so much going on all around. This is why, that's why we need like a more informative news service. Italian Senate approves a diluted civil unions bill, so it hasn't passed the House yet. But I noted that this is important because it's right in the front door of the Vatican. And the Vatican doesn't seem to be quite sure where it wants to stand on these issues. Oh, they're good on being pro-life. But when it comes to marriage, they're seeing themselves losing, 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 and so they're starting to clam up and not come out and support defense of marriage so much. Church position doesn't change. Church policy doesn't change, but maybe we just won't fight it. Maybe we just won't tell our parishioners to go out and lobby their representatives to say no to same-sex marriage. And so once they get the civil union foot in the door, same-sex marriage is sure to follow. And this other article about Romania. In Romania, 2.1 million people signed a petition to keep marriage between a man and a woman. And... This is important because I, I think it's more than just like a petition here. I think this will actually carry the law. So however they're doing it, and maybe it's a form of a referendum, if enough people sign on to this, then marriage stays between a man and a woman. But this is one of the ones that alarmed me because this is one of those countries where George Soros is spending his money mm. to try to change the law in places like Romania. And I think most of Western Europe has been conquered. I think there's uh, maybe Italy is one of those states. So uh, pretty much the rest of Western Europe has same-sex marriage. And I haven't looked at Eastern Europe, but these are the kind of things that we need to be watching because once they get all of Europe, well, what's to stop America from, from going on? We'll, we'll, we'll declare that we're not European when it comes to bringing in immigrants from South and Central America, or when it comes to bringing Muslims from wherever, or when it comes to representing black people. But when it comes to destroying the family and destroying our values, oh, we want to be just like Europe. You know, why don't we adopt the metric system and be like Lincoln Chafee? And to that end, you know, I've been looking at countries that still have traditional values, and there's a further article about the fact that Ireland, uh, just, or Northern Ireland, just resisted getting rid of their abortion law. So it's good that abortion is still illegal in Northern Ireland, whereas the rest of the UK is illegal. Mm -hmm. So it's not wrong to stand for your religious values. We should stand for our religious values. I believe that that is best maintained when states are sovereign. So this goes back to my point. If we can't keep our states sovereign, because we've already admitted defeat, you know, it was a battle that was lost you could say 150 years ago, but I would say 229 years ago, then let's go somewhere where we can live by our religious values. And the question is, well, where could we go? And I don't think people are thinking about that. Mm -hmm. And so when the, when the dam breaks and the waters come rushing in, you're just going to get washed away with the tide. And that's not where I want to be. I want to be in a position to live in freedom under my God. And that's why I'm fighting. I'm fighting on a political level. I'm trying to fight in the community and doing this radio show so that somebody will hear and it might, you know, maybe people with more resources than I can take action. But we need more people to join in that fight. We do. Okay. And, and just one more thing. I, I came across an article on the Hill, uh, 25, I think it's up to 26 now, started at 22, Republicans who won't back Donald Trump as a nominee. And this kind of made the headlines because Ben Sass looks like Sassy, S-A-S-S-E, mm -hmm. have been going around saying, I'm not going to vote for Trump. And I got interested in this because there are apparently a lot of senators. And another line from this Texas debate is Donald Trump is pointing at Ted Cruz and saying, Nobody likes him. You work with, in the Senate every day, and there isn't a single senator endorsing you. And that's pretty embarrassing, because Tim Scott, don't ask me why, endorsed Rubio. Didn't Rubio. You? Yeah. And, you know, again, there's that... Jeff like, Sessions endorsed Trump. Right. And there's, and there's that, you know, disgusting remark by Lindsey Graham that you could shoot Ted Kennedy and nobody would... Ted Cruz. Uh, Ted, Ted. <laughs> You'd have Ted to drown Cruz. Ted Kennedy. <laughs> exactly. You could shoot Ted Cruz and nobody would convict him. But, you know, some of the names on this list of 25 are important. Uh, for some, I guess because it's, his name begins with A, Justice Justin Amash is first, but he's 
definitely got libertarian credentials. You've got Glenn Beck, who a lot of people have written off at this point. You've got Eric Erickson, who conservative writer. I read a lot of his articles. Matt Kibbe from FreedomWorks. Governor George Pataki, if his name carries any weight. But the one that I think should carry weight for everyone is Representative, former Representative Ron Paul of Texas. I'm actually surprised that Rand Paul isn't on this list. But if Ron Paul isn't supporting the guy, you know there's something wrong with supporting the guy, at least from a, from a limited government point of view. Yeah. And we've also got Mark Sanford, Ben Sass, J.C. Watts. Okay, former former representative J.C. Watts, and several other names that should tell you Trump is not really worth supporting. Go vote for someone else. Go vote third party. Write in your own name. I don't. I, I never advise not voting. Right. Because and there's all that stuff down ballot. There's all the down ballot elections that matter. But to cast a vote for Trump is to enable. Well, you know, let me put it to you this way. I guarantee you, if he wins, then in a year or two, you'll be cursing his name. And you'll have no one to blame but yourself. Even if you live in a state like Maryland where Trump probably isn't going to win the 10 electoral votes, you will have cast a confirming vote. And that's something I couldn't live with. That's why, for the past two elections, I voted for the Constitution Party candidate. And I may very well end up doing that this time, especially if we are not given a good choice of a solid conservative. A lot of people have problems with Ted Cruz, and I understand your problems with Ted Cruz. You know, like the fact that his wife is in the CFR or associated with the CFR. And if that's enough, you know, fine. But I say, you know, Donald Trump has his close ties to George Soros. And I've seen these multi-billionaires using their money to spread evil around the world. As a matter of fact, I don't see them. I'm sure they give a whole lot to charity, but I don't see them doing any actual good in the world. So whether it's George Soros, Oprah Winfrey, Bill Gates, Warren Buffett, Jeff Bezos, we could, we could go down the list, you know, name as many billionaires in your, as you know, and tell me one who's spending his money to help defend traditional marriage. Tell me one who's spending his money to defund and destroy Planned Parenthood. Tell me one who's using his money to, to take a stand for religious liberty and I'll be surprised because I can't name a one. Every billionaire I know is on the wrong side of this and that includes Donald Trump. And, and, and that's another thing Ted Cruz brings out in this debate, just how much money Donald Trump has spent supporting leftist Democrats. And there was an article, I won't go into it right now, but there was an article that showed that Donald Trump had easily, by and far, given vast amounts of money more to Democrats than Republicans until 2011. And that's about the time he just started to say, hmm, maybe I'm going to run for president. And then he starts giving all this money to Republicans. And so now if you look at it, it looks like he's giving more money to Republicans. Don't tell me that's not strategic. So did he give it to the National Organization for Marriage or the Family Research Council or any other group that's fighting for our values? No. But he gave max donations to Hillary Clinton four times. Okay, until next time, keep fighting for freedom. And keep the faith. And keep the faith. And keep the faith. And keep the faith. And keep the faith.